Hi, kitty cats. I am Amethyst Taharic, your hostess for Gender Identity Weekly, a weekly discussion about identity and gender from the contributors and guests of the Purple Paw Publications website, Gender Identity Today. This content is brought to you by subscribers of Gender Identity Today. If you are already a subscriber, thank you so much for your ongoing support. Subscribers not only receive new content directly to their inboxes as soon as it publishes, but are also able to interact with every contributor directly, including me. Huh? If you would like to support shows just like this one, as well as other podcasts, videos, and all the written articles by our contributors, please consider subscribing using the links you're going to find in the show notes. Well, today I am so pleased to be speaking with Danny Velasquez Mora. Hi, Danny. Hey. Thank you so much for showing up. This is, I tell you, I know Danny, sorry, I should probably finish the rest of the introduction before I start fawning over you. Um, <laughs> Danny is the founder and creative director of Womankind Creative. And Danny and I kind of connected by chance. Um, she and I started talking about diversity in advertising. Actually, I should probably say the lack of diversity in advertising, because this is what Womankind Creative focuses on. And, you know, with with my whole shtick about gender and identity, I absolutely wanted to continue our discussion around dysphoria. So let me start with a really super obvious question. Just can you just tell me the story of Womankind Creative? Why did you want to create it? Yeah. So honestly, it came from a place of being really angry um, in my own personal healing journey and, and really coming into my own self-worth. Um, and so I guess um, if we back up two years, I you know was exiting a, I hate to use the word toxic in this day and age, it feels trite, but a very controlling relationship, you know, which I also played a role in, right? And in the healing journey, I really tried to take accountability as to what was my role in that and, and how did I kind of like co-create this experience for myself. Um, and what I really came to find is that through a lot of conditioning and internalized narratives, I was showing up really small and settling in a lot of ways, right? And that was showing up, you know, kind of as like how I viewed myself as a Latina, as a woman, as like what it meant to uphold like good girl ideals, you know, how I felt about myself, you know, and then everything else snowballed after that, right? Like, you know, because I may not feel worthy in one area of life, then I was thinking like, well, this is okay. I, I'm okay to receive this, or this is what I deserve, right? Sure. And yeah. And, and, you know, and I, and I don't think that is unique to me. It shows up differently for all of us it, based on like our life experiences. And so, you know, once I was done sort of being <laughs> mad at kind of like the, the relationship in that, then I was just more angry at society and like the, the conditioning that we all go through. And in that, I was like, I know I'm not alone in this. I know that as women, a lot of us are impacted by, you know, kind of like these ideals of what it is to be, you know, beautiful or like the perfect woman and, you know, kind of like always be seen, but not heard and, or, you know, smile and so forth. And those are kind of just the ones that are off the top of my head, but there's a lot of ways right. in which we show up in holding up these expectations and these molds of what it's like to be a good woman in society. And in that anger, I was like, okay, well, I want to change that. And in, in advertising and marketing, so much of our self-concepts come from that and are either reinforced that you're not good enough or that you are the, the, the good enough type. Um, and so I was like, okay, it really just re-energized me to think about how does this experience that I've had and come out of inform what I do and how our work can show up to help other women reaffirm that they are worthy of showing up in their full selves, you know, and, and also what does it look like to be a woman in marketing and advertising. And so what I mean by that is that still what is out there is a very um, monolithic narrative uh, that is still, you know, as you mentioned earlier in the show, not as representative as, as we want it to. Um, and though we've made progress, there's still so much room to make this narrative something that women feel supported by and actually want to see and be shown back. And so that is a long-winded answer to how we came to be. <laughs> not at all long-winded. I... 
you had started with saying a healing journey. Mm -hmm. So this was reclaiming 100%. your identity, your power as a woman. Yes. 1000%. And it, it was literally when I was doing the brief, I worked with someone to help me with copy and, 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 um, you know, what the narrative would be for women. Cause I was so close to it. I wanted to make sure that, um, it was as clear, but also as resonant as it could be. And in my brief to her, I said, you know, womankind creative is permission to unhide as women, oh but gosh. also for brands, you know, these brands that feel that they need to, you know, show up in traditional ways that they've seen in marketing and advertising. And rather than doing that, scrap it and find your authenticity as a brand. Right. So it's, it's a two side equation. Um, and I really, really like that. It is a, a reclaiming of self a reclaiming of being a woman, uh, and, and being whole and worthy in that. Oh, that's beautiful. I, I loved your use of the word unhide as well. Mm -hmm. Cause you can be completely hidden in full sight. Yes, 100%. Right, I mean, and, and it's so subconscious. I don't think we realize it, you know, and I think that really was like the takeaway from my lived experience, you know, was it all the ways in which I was hiding, right? And, and, and not, I'm not just saying just the relationship because these patterns are across the board, right? And even mm -hmm. things that we likely internalized and learned as early as like with our caretakers and our family dynamics, right? And so it really right. does show up in so many ways. Yes. Can, I, I don't want to get too personal. Mm -hmm. how, how did, or I mean, get as personal as you want, I suppose. Yeah. But I mean, like, what, what was the, what was the healing? How have you changed as a result of, of founding Womankind? Yeah. Um, whew, so I think I would say like one of the biggest things that I've addressed is feeling comfortable and deserving to prioritize myself. And I think that oh, this God. is a theme for a lot of women, because as like, I guess the, you know, um, designated caretakers of society, our right. role is often seen as we're here to nourish others. And that is what should bring us joy. Right. And we are secondary too, right. So what that, does, I think it's like, you know, whether it's your friends, your family, your partner, um, you're kind of doing mental gymnastics to appease and to people please. And yeah. even at your own detriment or not meeting your own needs. And so, you know, I think what's interesting about being a founder and an entrepreneur is that it puts a magnifying glass on any of those limiting beliefs or wounds and or coping mechanisms oh. that we use. And it forces yeah. us to look at it. So on a personal place, you know, definitely, I think in any relationship, I, I was often the one who was happy to be like, oh, you know, I'm, I'm easy, like, uh, whatever you want, you know, delegate to others and, and allow their decisions, their wants to be prioritized. And I would just, you know, kind of make myself malleable to that. Um, and, or to feel like the need to be perfect and what their standard was for perfection in order to not then be abandoned. I had a really big wound and fear around if I'm not perfect, then I'm not deserving of love and, and someone's likely to, to leave and, or just withdraw right. their care and love for me. Um, and then in like the, the founder place where that can easily translate is like, you know, not having clear boundaries with clients or even as the way that you, for example, manage money in your business, putting all the other needs before potentially even paying yourself as like an entrepreneur and founder. And I think that that's very common. And so, um, I think that has been a major, major thing that I've addressed is being okay with saying like, I need to be well and whole and taken care of. And my needs are important. They're not frivolous, um, in order for me to show up in the way that I need to show up to then do the work that I want to do and build the legacy that I'm looking to build through womankind. Right so difficult to do though to to learn to prioritize yourself 100 yeah. percent. it's not a the you know i it, my opinion and i actually want to ask you the you know the the how you chose the the phrase womankind creative but, but i'm gonna <laughs> let me throw something out first because my I, I feel like the only people who are supposed to be able to prioritize themselves are these alpha male CEO type people or the, I'm trying to think of was passport bro. <laughs> starting to be a, 
starting to be a, a vibe, I guess, the, the passport pros who are like, you know, I'm going to go from country to country, just, you know, apparently leaving a string of broken hearts. I was about to go a bit more graphic, but luckily I reined it in at the end. So is, but that's, those are the only people supposedly capable of prioritizing themselves. Mm -hmm. So does, is the name a reaction to, you know, the word mankind or is it, tell me about the name. So I'll be honest. I mean, I, I love, I love the positioning of that, that you just mentioned. And, um, I guess we can get into like the, why we think that that is the only person who is, uh, eligible Please. for prioritizing themselves, which yes. is so much of it is just really societal gender, uh, constructs, right? Um, sure. So it's, it's it's not real. Uh, but and I think you know that already. So I don't even need to say that. But where did womankind come from? It's actually a, more simple than that. I'll be honest with you. So I am a, you know, a passionate meditator. And I and I believe in like getting pings and downloads from the universe. And um, honestly, I was meditating and it, this was like, let's call it like six months after like the initial changes and shifts in my life. And I had been so deep in, you know, reconnecting with self and spending so much time with like, you know, my own thoughts and journaling. And in one of those sessions, I was kind of just like laying down, actually going to bed. And I kind of had this like download and like womankind popped into my head. And I was like, holy shit, am I doing this? Am I changing the name? Yeah. Especially because, um, you know, the prior name of my business is called Vel Velamora and my last name is Velasquez Mora. So it was very much sure. like a representation of my heritage. It's my, you know, my dad's name and my mother's maiden name. So oh. when I wanted to change the name, even in that I had to continue this, this, active reclaiming of what is important mm -hmm. to me and what does Danny want and how does she stop people pleasing? So I remember telling my dad was actually one of like the first kind of like moments of like putting into practice, prioritizing self and trusting my decisions and my view and telling him like, I am going to change the name and it's going to be this. And I was so afraid that he was almost going to feel like a knock, you know, like getting rid of his name in it. And sure. it obviously it was completely the opposite, but it's just cool how even in these like micro things that we don't perceive as a big deal, we're constantly being given the opportunity to put into practice these lessons and this prioritizing of self and feeling worthy enough to take up space and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, yeah, I hate to let you down with it being more simple than, than, than that, but it is though. I do like about it that it is a play on mankind. And it's funny, oftentimes people don't even see the, that connection. People think it's because what we're wanting to do is create advertising and marketing that is woman positive. So I guess kind yes. to women. Uh, so people right. do see that in it, but it was a play on, you know, womankind. We are the 52% <laughs> of, um, if not more of this other equation um, that is so powerful. And I, and I love like that because it's not used so often like that, you know, mankind feels strong and it's like, we are equally, I don't want to say if not more, um, powerful, right. We have this energy. Right. And, and though, um, I actually heard in one of your previous episodes, you were talking to someone else and y'all were talking about the divine feminine and how oftentimes, you know, the energetics behind it, because it is, I wouldn't even say softer. It's a different energy. It's an energy of receiving. Mm -hmm. It's an energy of like, I think, women are superpowers to inspire. Like when we are in, in secure and in this place of, you know, yeah, our divine feminine, the way that we move, the way that we integrate our energy and I'm moving. And it's funny because even the way I'm moving is like in that divine feminine kind of like, mm, like rich juiciness. And we infuse everything we touch with that. And that is in my mind, so important for the divine masculine. That's how they also kind of like are able to, you know, be larger than life and, and then manifest and create, right? It's a, this beautiful counterpart and balance. Um, and so I do love that in the, in, in the womankind name, it brings that equal power because there isn't one divine yes. without the other. Um, it's a beautiful balance that we need to find again in, in society. Yes. Oh, I agree wholeheartedly. I did not know the story Valmora to to womankind because mm -hmm. I mean when you told me that story here's what I heard I heard I was focusing it on my story mm -hmm. and then I realized my story is bigger my story mm. is part of womankind and I had to make it bigger to encompass the entire universe kind of like the divine feminine does uh, I just got chills on me Ooh, yeah do you know I did too <laughs> And it's, it's, I love that you said that because 
even in that, it's almost like you reflecting back to me, my journey to giving myself permission to take up space, which is like right. what we're here to do and exemplify right. for other women, whether they're the, whether they're the founder or whether they're on the receiving end of the marketing and advertising to just take up space in your life. Like you are worthy and deserving to be perceived for who you are and who you are is worthy. It is beautiful. It is, it is you know, it's divinely feminine. It's, it's beautiful in that sense. And, and, uh, we've done so much damage to people's self image through marketing and advertising. Very much, very much. Gosh, such a great story. Um, I guess uh, let's go ahead and move on to that then. Yeah. Um, because what is, what is really portrayed as, as important today, I mean, it's in, it's, it's in all media. It isn't marketing and advertising. It's, it's all actually, do I, I was about to say movies and, and music. Does that count? Yes. Yeah. I mean, of- I think everything we consume, right. Is constantly reinforcing whether consciously okay. or subconsciously these narratives. Right. And I think actually it's even more pertinent potentially in watching movies and things like that when you're in a subconscious state and it's literally just priming your mind constantly. Right. Right. But, but it really points to this idea that there's, you know, a superhuman and sorry, not right. A superman. Mm-hmm that is going to save everything and take care of everybody. And we're all supposed to go. Thank you so much. Superman who has done this for me, Superman. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Superman. Because if I didn't have this super man, I would so just fall apart. (laughs) So, (laughs) wow. I played that one, didn't I? Jesus. (laughs) I just want to thank everybody for this Oscar. Oh God, I'll never forget it. Thank you. Um, apologies. Do you know that's actually a quote from a Tracy Lord's song? Do you remember Tracy Lord's? No. Okay. She started off a huge tangent. I swear I'll come back in. She started off as a as a um in, in pornography as mm-hmm. as a as a pornographic actress. And I think she was 16. She might have been 17. And that was she ended up getting booted out. Mm-hmm. But people were like, well, God, she's she's pretty good. She was in a couple of movies. I know she was in at least one movie with Johnny Depp called um, Cry Baby, I think. I think that okay. was it. Anyway, she ended up making music. Like, and I thought it was good music. She had an album in 2000 or so called a thousand, 1000 fires. Mm-hmm. And, uh, anyway, that la- the last song on the album had that little bit. I want to thank everybody for this Oscar. Oh, anyway, I love it. <laughs> I'm going to bring it back together. Sorry. We- <laughs> I love so it. Much fu- <laughs> thank you. Yeah. My tangents end up, you know, and then I have to explain them too. Cause people go, what the <laughs> fine hell was, oh, it was a tangent. Hang on. Um, but so much focus on, on the masculine. So, Mm -hmm. you know, just, just to discuss, because originally where we kind of bonded was the idea of diversity in, in marketing. Um, I think I I had a conversation with Amanda Lean. I think, you know, Amanda, Mm -hmm. um, it was a few weeks back about representation in, in fiction. Mm. Why do we need representation in, I mean, we, and Amanda and I spoke about all kinds of representation. She's chronically ill, wanted, um, you know, representation of chronic illness in, mm-hmm. in fiction and has written some herself. So I'll just start with this question. Why, why do we need, there's a, this is a big, yeah. an, a big answer you're going to have to give, but why do we need this diversity? What's, what's the purpose? Uh, so, to me, it all boils down to ex- expansion. Uh, so we need to be able to see other people who we associate with and, and we believe like are aligned with our idea of self in order to see what is possible for us. Mm-hmm. Um, and so for better or for worse, right. So we have, for example, like, let's go back to the passport bros or like the, you know, wall street bros that the predominantly, you know, Caucasian 
good looking man for whom this system has been built or built by, right? right. For those people, we, we may see that things may come a little bit easier because it's been reaffirmed to them constantly through movies, advertising, um, even just looking outside into their lives what their role is in this world. They're able to thrive. They make connections, right? And so I think um, it allows them to be in a mindset where they show up wholly and are able to pursue these dreams, right? Um, and so where that gets tricky is when you don't see that out there for yourself, you may make ideas of what is your role in society? And so I guess to kind of like bring this back, one of the things that I tapped into when I was going through my healing journey was, you know, and now we see Latinas and Latinos in a lot more spaces being successful and, and thriving. But in the 90s, that wasn't necessarily the case, right? And, you know, growing True. up, you know, what I saw as representation of Latinos, it was a lot of the time blue collar workers. It was often, you know, the janitorial yes. staff or like the tamale lady, right. to be honest, you know? And so the idea that I realized was like, as a Latina, I had the, the role that I had was to survive, never to thrive. And oh. even the the representation of women that are thriving, you know, you had a J-Lo, but like J-Lo's like a, I mean, she's a badass, but like, we don't share that many parallels. Like, you know what I mean? And so it becomes so important nowadays when you do see representation of like someone that could be like me, who's writing a book about how people of color can invest and, and thrive. And like, you know, and so it's like expanding the idea of what's possible for you. That's so important. And it's important so that you can show up in life fully. And there's like anecdotes of like, you know, little girls who don't feel good about themselves, who are not raising their hands in school because they don't want to be perceived. They don't want to be seen or, you know, women who won't show up to big milestones, like maybe their friend's wedding or baby shower or even their own milestones because they don't feel beautiful or want to be seen. Right. And so, right. you know, at the very crux of it, it's kind of like, we are all entitled and deserving of living full lives, whatever that means to us. And it's important to have representation so that we actually feel worthy to go and live that. And then on a societal level, then we can have really amazing leaders who can make change that, that is good for all of us, all of us, you know, and, and that is, and I say that twice because I guess the thought that came into my mind is like that in my mind is the idea of feminism is so that we can, you know, have a society that's beneficial to all of us that embraces us, that is representative and pulling for all of our well-being, not just a specific few. Right. I have to tell you, I'm, I'm going to gush for just a moment. I have never heard such a good reasoning behind the idea of representation than, than you just gave. Thank you. Um, well, it, I've had some people, I had somebody once send me an email and I was so flattered, but the, the email said, the fact that you exist, that I can see you, you know, makes me feel like I'm, like I'm valid, you know, that, that there's, that there's, there's the ability, you know, for the world. Now, of course I'm butchering the quote, but it was, you know, that you exist gives me hope was yeah. essentially what she said. And I'll tell you, I didn't, I didn't understand it until what you just said. Mm. If we see that representation, then we see what could be possible. It just never struck me like that. I've thought to myself, well, yeah, of course. I mean, we want to be able to see people like, you know, who we are, but it's, it's so that we end up getting the inspiration to, to do everything or, you know, that we can do. Mm -hmm. um, my gosh is over, but oh my gosh, such a great, such a great explanation. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> well, so, but cause see, they're like part of me, and Amanda and I had some conversation around this. Part of me sees a lot of the the representation as token. Hundred percent. Then I'll stop talking, Tim. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, "You do, say no more." A um, hundred percent, right? Um, so, why is that? If you ask me, when it comes to advertising and marketing, uh, it's it's. <laughs> two-sided. So I still feel, and, and I don't just feel, I know there is still a lack of representation in 
who is putting out this content, this marketing and advertising. Um, okay, true. Because it's yeah. still, you know, um, favors like the employment, let's say, and these organizations still favor male Caucasian employees, right? When we look at creative directors, largely male, you know, even when we're looking at like the, the creatives on the team, right? So it makes it difficult then to have true representation that isn't token because how can you possibly exhibit characters and show, you know, um, you know, these, the people who are cast or the narratives that you're being, that are being shared as anything beyond surface. And so, you know, sure. like then you, you just plug it in. Oh, well, we just showed this person, but it's kind of like when you see, you know, if I'm looking to see a Latina, I'm not looking to see someone who's voluptuous with big boobs and her big hair. And she's like spicy tamale. Like that's all I've ever been shown. What I want to see, right. Is, right. Like someone who can show up it, that isn't just defined by that. She's so much more than, yes. right? And it's the same for like women in general, like show us as the ones who are witty and smart, you know, and not just on the receiving end being vapid and laughing like, oh, you know, like empower us, right? But it's like, you wouldn't know that that is a female experience if you haven't lived it or if you're not listening and tapped in enough. And, you know, I hate to say it as humans, we have a tendency to only tap in and listen to what is like us and what's familiar, you know? Sure. And so that's why it's so important. Hire the people who you're looking to target, you know, like if this is who you're looking to connect with for it, in order for it to be authentic, it needs to be coming from a place of sharing in right. Um, rather than like performative stuff. And I just feel like, unfortunately in an effort to just, be trendy or keep, keep up with the tactics. Some brands um, tend to just, yeah, be token in, in how they do things. Check. We have someone who's handicapped. Check. We have someone who's LGBTQ. Check. We have a woman. Sure. And it's like, well, no, that, that actually, if anything, feels even more offensive now. <laughs> right. Because they always end up being, I don't, almost like caricatures. You yes. Know? Oh, I love have, that wording. 100% if you're going to have somebody who's disabled, that person's in a wheelchair, right? Mm -hmm. With like an electric one. You know, if you're going to have somebody who's, who's, you know, LGBT, you know, that person's going to have like rainbow, like I should be talking here, but that person's going to have like rainbow hair and, and, you know, like a sick caricature that, that yes. I, I mean, in my opinion, cause I see that kind of representation. I, I tend to get turned off by it. Mm -hmm. I tend mm -hmm. to go, oh. Let's I don't want to see it, it right, right, and and it does nothing, or at least for me, it becomes more offensive, like you mm -hmm. said. Yeah. Um, I think what was amazing, uh, also to go back <laughs> to gush, con to continue to gush <laughs> about your <laughs> <don't> previous <laughs> statement. I mean, because I think a lot of times people, I don't know about a lot of times. I think there was sort of a prevailing attitude that if you have a certain amount of representation, what it does is take away from, from other narratives, I guess, for lack mm -hmm. of a better word, that if you represent LGBT, Latina culture, every, you know, all of that, anything, I guess, other than what is the prevailing narrative, that it's some kind of zero sum game and somebody loses, but your message was that representation, when we show that, uplifts everybody yeah. because everybody gets to see what we can do. Yeah. And I think, so uh, I will not claim to be any sort of expert on this, but in, in going back to the episode where you guys were discussing like the divine feminine and feminism, you know, I do think that this kind of scarcity mindset then tends back to like the downfall of like capitalism. And, you know, like I, I won't right. dive super deep into it because again, I'm not an expert, but I think that a lot of this sort of zero sum game comes from this place of, yeah, we always need someone to be enslaved in some way or, or at the short end of the stick, you know, in yeah. order for the system to work. And in my mind, what that should point at is the system is broken rather than upholding it. Why don't we try thinking of a different way? Right. Um, right. And even, even in feminism, right. Like we've been talking a lot more about like white feminism on our channel um, because, you know, and we actually made a post from, um, 
was that like the, the Oscar nominations and mm-hmm. how so many people were outraged that Margot and, you know, Greta Gerwig didn't get nominated. And like, you know, yes, like, of course, Barbie was incredible and it did do such a big labor for where we're looking ahead. But then you have, you know, uh, America Ferrera, And then um, there was Danielle right. that also got like nominated for like supporting actresses. And so we have Latina and black women who are, you know, breaking, you know, in out into being seen, right? We also had the first Native American uh, um, lead actress, you know, be nominated. Uh, And so it's like, because it was so clouded by a narrative of what didn't happen for these white women who have more of a center stage, we'll say, the the other people got overshadowed. And like, I know that what I would like to think when I look at like Greta and Margot, that would never be like their personal intent, but be, because of like the societal way of like, I think like um, the volume of conversation by everyone else mm-hmm. and, and their hyper focus on these women, it was like the other women almost got overshadowed, you know? And like, it's, it's heartbreaking, right? Because it kind of goes back to exactly going back to the representation piece, like, little girls who could look towards these women who did make history or who are making advancements for different type of women, what does it say to them when those achievements are not nearly as recognized as like the fallout of these white women who were not? Right. 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 You know, what's in, I mean, a fascinating thought there that, that's, um, that trying to foster representation could actually obscure other you know equally or greater uh representation um um, i want to remember how the hell i how the hell i came up with this when i was growing up here was here was going to be my question did Mm -hmm. have you do you read any comic books at all Oh, so I love that you're wearing Sailor Moon. I never read, I don't know if that was a comic book. I watched the show, but comic books themselves actually, no, I'm like a diehard self-help girly. (laughs) So, so growing up, I loved Wonder Woman. I mean, Wonder Mm. Woman was, was so much my favorite. And then of course, every Wonder Woman you see, um, you know, Linda Carter was Miss America, right? I mean, started off as a Miss America. Um, We ended up, you know, ultimately, they when when they made a, a a Wonder Woman movie, it was Gal Gadot, right? I mean, not, mm-hmm. I mean, she's Israeli, right? So, and I and I know there were people. I mean, I remember getting in an Uber, and I don't even know how we got on the topic, but the guys, I think the guy just said, "Hey, have you seen the new Wonder Woman movie?" And I'm like, "Uh, no." And he goes, "Yeah, you know, I want somebody more voluptuous. This is like some Israeli bent." And I'm like, "Wait, why was that bad?" My point was going to be really not Wonder Woman, but there was a um, there was a comic book and I think it actually folded, which is a bummer. Mm -hmm. Um, But it's Wonder Girl. And and uh, now for the life of me, I'm going to forget her name. Of course, I have a poster in the other room. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's in the other room. Um, Wonder Girl is 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 a real Amazon. She's actually from, you know. Themyscira is supposed to be Amazons, and you go, well, that's, you know, okay. <laughs> but actually from South America, mm-hmm. um, has like a, a head of bolo as a, as a weapon. And I mean, it, to me, bringing that culture into the story of, of Wonder Woman, in this case, Wonder Girl, I mean, I loved it. I adored it. I was so I w- kept, I've been waiting for more uh, issues, and they're not coming. And and uh, I find that disappointing. Yeah. Um, I mean, I grew up in Southern California, and so I was really. I mean, you can see I'm I'm a touch white. You know, my <laughs> my background's European, but you know, German and Irish I, and British, and but I mean, I grew up steeped in that culture in mm-hmm. in in um, particularly Mexican culture and, uh, you know, the idea that it just gets squelched. Mm-hmm. I don't know where I'm, where else I was going to go with this particular, you know, tangent, but it pisses me off, I guess, you know? Yeah. Well, and, and like, I think what I find most troubling and sort of like, even like going back to token sort of like use of like representation and diversity, right. Is being able to give these, um, other 
like ethnic groups or, um, you know, people of color, or LGBTQ, like starring roles, right? Because I sure. think it also kind of goes back to like, what is not being said is still being internalized. So to your point, yeah. like if Wonder Woman was also, was usually depicted as, you know, traditionally beautiful woman who is slender, who may be, you know, Caucasian or like white passing of some sort, what we're, what we're, maybe not being said and maybe not even aware that we're taking in is that like in order to be a woman that is powerful, that has an avenue to create change or fight for justice or, you know, be of superhero, I don't know, value, you need to be thin, traditionally beautiful, white passing of some sort. Right. Um, And so that's where it gets tricky. And, and, you know, I think you can even see it in like, for example, like, religion and like you you know not to get go down that avenue but like you know how is jesus portrayed who is he a white man you know what i mean so it, and it's, right. it's interesting right and um again it's like sometimes i'd like to think it's not necessarily intentional it's sometimes all we've ever known and we're so heavily conditioned yes. Uh, that yes. it, it almost like boggles our brain when we see different. And it's so beautiful to see that we are going down a new path. Like for example, um, Encanto, um, being Colombian, seeing that movie, I left the movie theater like, this is why representation matters. Like I was almost in tears, like listening to like the theme song and like celebrating Colombia and all its beauty. And it just, it helped me feel, or it, no, no, not helped me. It made me feel that where I come from is special because it was mm-hmm. given a center state. Right. And so I think we all deserve the opportunity to see ourselves, whatever that is, whoever that is as special, you know, and and it really is so healing. I I was going to try to punctuate that, but I kind of don't want to. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Because it was so beautiful. Um, you you alluded to what what we respond to currently in in marketing mm. you know that that sometimes we just don't know that there is a the a, you know another another anything to which we could respond mm-hmm. i mean standards so the question i want to ask is like what what does sell i mean i hate to put it like that but like what <laughs> What sells at this point? I think it's shifting and I think that's so exciting. And that's why I sort of think like, while there's still a lot of room for work and progress, um, you know, I don't want it to feel like overwhelming that like, oh, we're doomed. We're not. There's so much change and it's so beautiful. And I think, you know, a big part of that is social media has, you know, democratized the way whose voices yes. is heard. And so right. that, you know, more people are heard. And, you know, if brands choose, they have the opportunity to employ social listening skills and actually deliver on what their communities care about and want from them. And what's, you know, then double that in because now I guess let's call it the population has like a a platform to um, use. You see consumers start to demand a lot more of brands. Right. 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 Uh, And I think that is so tremendously inspiring and something that like we are constantly talking about with brands is that, um, the requirement now and the way that these relationships have traditionally been seen where I feel like brands almost felt entitled to people's attention and or dollars. And, you know, it was kind of like a no brainer that you would shop from us because now there's a lot of DTC, D, uh, DTC brands, right? They're selling, selling directly to consumers through the internet that are founded by, you know, um, you know, whether it's women, women of color, um, you know, there's a lot of, you know, LGBTQ founders, there's you know, founders that are coming out because they're seeing that their communities and their needs are not being met by the traditional brands that are out there right. um, and right. are being aided by the internet and creating these sales and being successful and taking up space in the market. Um, it's kind of all creating this tension, right? Where brands have to to listen. And the relationships really need to be uh, more balanced, you know, where yes, the consumer gets a solution through the products that the brand is offering, but the brand is also cognizant that without their consumers, there is no success. And so I, I really am excited for that change of brands becoming more aware, more caring, and really taking to heart that like, we need one another. Uh, and, and you know, I think it kind of yeah goes back to that that overarching idea. Like we are just people helping people, and if we can scope into a space of serving, and how do we show up for the communal good? 
like it's it's all going to be much better. <laughs> Absolutely. I, I as you were as you were talking it made me wonder because I mean this this shift in in marketing is relatively new. I mean certainly probably not even a decade I yeah. would guess. Do <sighs> Obviously, I mean, you haven't been in every board meeting, I suppose, mm -hmm. but I mean, do you feel that there were that marketing agencies thought, well, it's okay for people to feel powerless? I don't think so. I, maybe that's my naive side. I don't think that anyone has the intent to make others feel bad. I really want to believe that. I just think because we didn't have platforms where people weren't filtered out, whether consciously, unconsciously, intentionally or unintentionally, these voices were getting filtered out. And then if you do see that at these boardrooms, it's primarily one demographic over another. Well, it's again, sure. natural that these biases exist. It's, it's, I think it's like the okay. human condition, you know? Um, so okay. I do think that the change is as a result of the platforms being available, but even like, TikTok, I, I would credit. And I think that that's why TikTok is such like a, a you know, scary thing for, for, and it's like, you know, being able to, people are trying to filter it. And like, we're having so many hearings about like, what is TikTok doing? And it's because it's putting this beautiful um, opportunity for all of us to connect, to hear one another from all these different backgrounds and, and experiences. And we're starting to see one another. And, and I think I genuinely believe as people, we just want to connect and we all just want the same thing. We all want to be happy. We want to be, it, it feel joy and feel secure at the end of the day. And so I think that's what I would credit a lot of the change to is like, once we get to hear one another and I get to, you know, hear from you, Ami, and what you're struggling with and, you know, and I'm kind of like, wow, like that resonates with me because I, I can, you know, identify where in my lived experience I may have had similar struggles and, and I, my heart goes out to you, then now all of a sudden I'm going to care about your cause too, not just my own, right? Uh, and so I think we start to rally for one another and, and that's where it's all coming from is like people seeing one another and saying like, hey, you know, we deserve better. Um, that is really, I think, driving the change. I hope so. Because I, I, I mean, <laughs> I mean, not, not, that wasn't intended to be sort of a, well, let me just drop a, yeah, sure. It, be, because obviously identity is universal. I mean, mm -hmm. every single one of us has to, has to develop or discover it is what I want to, what I want to say. And, and there's more than the white, you know, male identity. Yeah. Um, I, I would love, I feel Maybe I'm just more cynical than you, but I feel there was more to to um, the the way marketing used to be than mm -hmm. than ignorance, and, and I mean in ignorance actually in sort of a kind way that that yeah. you know it wasn't it wasn't clear that there was a bigger market than just white mm -hmm. men, you know, yeah. and I I sense that there was more to it than that, but I I certainly hope that that yeah. it was just ignorance and now marketing companies, marketing agencies yeah. are going, oh my gosh, look, there's so many more people to whom we can sell. Yeah. And well, I yes. So I think, yes, I think it'd be naive to not address that. And I think that's part of the exciting thing as well is that as society has continued to progress, I mean, the, the, the female buying power cannot be ignored. You know, oh gosh, I, um, no. I believe it's like, 13.8 trillion globally that we control. Wow. So, it, and that's actually, it's funny that you say that because for me, the story of just taking our power back and changing the narrative, that is potent enough. But when I have, you know, pitched our, you know, what we do um, to audiences that may not uh, identify quite as openly with that experience, I have, you know, put in those numbers and shown like, listen, even if it's not from like a purely like emotional or social justice endeavor, the money and the dollar signs are yes. there to not give women agency to not look at these other markets. is just bad business. You know, even when you get more granular as to looking at, you know, women, uh, plus size women, right? Like the shopping experience for plus size women is it's dismal. It's so upsetting. You know, if you go into a store, they may not have your size. So like go on the internet, go find it. Like, again, what does that say to you that they don't even carry your size? But 
just looking at those numbers, brands that choose to ignore that market because maybe they want to be more exclusive or, you know, don't want those people in their clothing, which is like repulsive. Um, yeah. Even if you just look at the dollar signs, you're ignoring a massive market, not to mention in the United States, plus size, quote unquote, uh, is uh, the big, like, I don't want to, I don't know if it's the majority because I don't want to butcher that, but I have looked at the numbers. I just can't think of at the top of my head, but it's a massive, massive part of the population. You know, Very like the double zero yes. is not the norm. It's like 16 or 18, you know, upwards. Right. Oh my gosh. Yes. And, and really you're actually, for what it's worth, describing the transgender woman experience. Cause I go mm. into a store and I'm like, oh, everything's a size two. Mm. I'm going to need to stick a zero on the end of that if I expect to wear it. Mm -hmm. And every shoe is too small. Mm -hmm. um, I actually found out recently. So, you know, obviously I've been in hormone therapy. Mm -hmm. Hormone therapy has actually made me shorter, mm -hmm. which is interesting. But it also shrank my feet, if mm -hmm. you can believe it. My my. So now I'm a size 11, which mm -hmm. opens up because it used to be a size 12. And you cannot buy size 12 shoes to save your life. Certainly not in a store. Yeah. I've just opened up a whole world of footwear, but I, sh I had to shrink in order to do that. And mm. I mean, you know, many, many transgender women, women are not going to, and, and yeah. it's a, maybe, maybe a smaller market than the cisgender market, but still a market. It's, Why it's would so you, important. you know? Absolutely. Yeah. And I think that that kind of like, I guess to like go full circle to how we began the conversation about why representation matters and not just in what's being shown, but in the people who yeah. are leading uh, and founding these companies, it's because you are, and I think this also kind of comes back to the core of like, why is it important that people feel worthy? Because people need to understand that what you have to offer in the way that you're offering is going to be valuable to someone out there, yeah. right? Because even like you pointing right. out, you're describing the experience of a trans woman. You know, I've never lived that. So I may have never had that filter, but now hearing that you're like, duh, that makes so much sense. And like, you know, to your point, it is a market, but also like there are needs out there that like you or someone within the community that has that lived experience is rightfully equipped to address these needs so that other people out right. there don't have to feel like they're outside of what is normal or acceptable. That's such right. an ugly feeling. Oh, yes. Very ugly. Um, you know, we, we started now we're starting to run low on time. It's funny we originally started talking just about gender dysphoria. Mm -hmm. um, I was even thinking, you know, the title of the of this episode, implying gender dysphoria, and I think I'm going to mm -hmm. probably change that. But um, I want to. I'm trying to figure out how even to formulate this question because I I feel womankind creative. Let me let me come from another direction. When what we originally bonded over with gender dysphoria had to do with what you were seeing in marketing, which were the, the blonde hair, the blue eyes, you know, the five, two C, you know, standard, the standard woman, right? Like pretty much all of them are five, two, thirty six. from the factory. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Yeah. That's, that's the way they just had one mold is all it was. Mm -hmm. So, you know, <laughs> and, and so you had experienced a sense of, of, yeah. I think you you thought of it as body dysmorphia, mm -hmm. is, is how we, we thought of it before, um, or, or is how you had described it before, sorry. Mm -hmm. um, there, marketing caters to social expectations, mm -hmm. I believe. Mm -hmm. I mean, I have the sense that that's why marketing works, because it plays into social expectations. Mm -hmm. um, before I go further, does... What do you, yes. what do you feel about that yeah. statement? No, thank you for, cause I was about to like jump in. So it's funny. It's kind of like a reinforcement cycle, right? Which is under the system that we're in women's role for so long has been contingent on the value that's given to them by men. So mm. if I want a man to give me a certain type of, uh, let's call it a, a reward, whatever that looks like, you know, marriage, money, access to certain things that for a while women did not have access to on their own, what do I need to do? Well, I need to be appealing to a man. So I need to uphold the beauty standards that society has put in place that came sure. from a man, you know? And so I think that's kind of where we get 
that into like the male gaze versus the female gaze and how that's starting to change. Because now that as women, we have access to making our own money and like, you know, our opportunities have gotten better and we may not need a man in order to access these opportunities and build ourselves. Right. We've decided right. that, you know, these standards are bullshit. And now we want to start doing things that we feel good about. What do I think is beautiful? Yeah. Whether that's, you know, whatever size, whatever color, maybe I don't need to have, you know, perfectly smooth skin. Maybe it's okay for me to have acne or scars or Lord forbid cellulite. You know what I mean? It's like all of a sudden we're, we've just, yeah, seriously, everyone stop, you know, and it's kind of giving ourselves that permission. And that I think, um, is is beautiful and I guess start to go like I guess full circle on then like like the uh why it's worked is because before we had to buy into it in order to be given value by society right now that like our value is changing that's why marketing is having to change because those traditional messages are not working anymore because we've decided actually no we don't need to show up that way in order to be whatever it is get the opportunity get the this this and that and so i think that's why we're seeing that shift and why it used to work and why now we're moving away from everything coming from the male gaze and we're giving other gazes or other filters the opportunity to exist and to be used yes do you know i if you want to really bring it full circle, what this does, you you're, you have embarked on a healing journey for really everybody. Mm. And, and it's not, that's not just women. We change marketing because, you know, obviously, I mean, I've mentioned I'm transgender. We all know this here. But growing up, I was dorky. I was, you know, um, sometimes overweight. Uh, and that marketing didn't work didn't work for me either because I'm looking at you know GQ people you know guys on the cover of GQ and I'm like yeah, yeah no fucking way yeah, and I, and <laughs> I, I wish, wish but no yeah no and I, I appreciate you bringing that up because I actually I love that we're gonna hit on this what we're here to do as womankind and again going back to the idea of like what I like to think of feminism and there's so many like branches of it and so many brands yeah. of it let's call it is that it is for everyone and that men are equally stunted and affected by these standards. It just not may, it may not be as like obvious maybe that like they too are harmed by kind of like, let's call it like, you know, like the to toxic masculinity, not being able to express in an emotional way and feeling right. like you need to like shove all that down. Or to your point that the ideal body for a man is six pack and like amazing. And like, that is not realistic. Right either you know and so yeah. it, it i love that you brought that up it does affect everyone um and it is a larger conversation and for me personally like the more that i you know get to meet you know more people and, and talk about those things i feel more comfortable talking about that narrative but i i have chosen you know for womankind for us to be focused on like what we can speak on like fully from a lived experience and then inviting yeah. other people then to own their own narratives as well and, and using our platform to share in that because I feel like for so long other people have been mouthpieces for all of us whether that's women you know we have men talking for us you know or or across the board for everyone right and so it's like I don't want to be the mouthpiece for anyone else because those people deserve to take up the space and be the ones to speak to those experiences themselves um, because it, I think it's part of taking up that space and feeling like I'm worthy of doing that somebody else doesn't have to do that for me Right. Right. And I, hopefully what I said didn't, didn't sound like it was diminishing anything that you're oh, doing no. with woman. No. Okay, good. Not at all. You added, you added everything. <laughs> okay. Because there's, I have no doubt that, um, you know, there are men out there who seeing really anybody be able to, to, to take back their own empowerment, mm -hmm. it helps them. And, and uh, candidly, I do not believe that that some of the people who are that you know engage in toxic ma masculinity, mm -hmm. I do not believe that they enjoy that. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. I cannot imagine walking around and somebody saying, "You know, you're kind of a dick," and mm -hmm. they go, "Yep, yeah, yep. I like that." Hundred percent. I I don't think I can believe that. And if and they're I, not aware, then it's kind of like 
it reflects in your life, if that makes sense. So you may not be aware yeah. that it's like this toxic masculinity is harming you or, or the patriarchy is harming you, but you may just feel dissatisfied, right? And we see the studies of like, you know, the, the lonely men, I don't know if it's a syndrome, but let's go ahead and call it that, right? So it's, right. And, and that, you know, men are more likely to, you know, potentially engage in, 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 in suicide um, because they don't feel connection. And, and you know, it, it's, it is really sad. And I, and I do actually so appreciate that you brought that up because it's important to give that airtime because so much of the conversation in feminism, it's like, feels like it's constantly like women, 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 or, you know, like it's not fair. And there is nothing wrong with that. And that is very valid, but two things can be true. So it can be yes. Right. And, and so I right. love that you brought that up. It's, yeah, I mean, you know, my, my message is, you know, each of us has to engage in a process of identity and gender and mm. lot, a lot of, I mean, which, which ends up being having to figure out where do we stand in our, in our social environment. And each of us, believe it or not, is part of a society, unless you're living on like a, like a ranch in Montana, you know, mm -hmm. I, I, like Harrison Ford, apparently. Oh, really? <laughs> apparently. Yeah, maybe he's not a part of society. <laughs> You know, maybe he's in Wyoming. I don't recall, but he's got like some, you know, like 14 million, you know, he's got like half the state of, of something and he's got like his own airstrip and stuff. And maybe he doesn't have to worry at this point about being part of society, but the rest of us do. Cause you know, believe it or not, I can't like ship everything in, uh, you know, to, to do what I want to do. But so your, your message of inclusivity, like, I think that's, um, I think that's one part of inclusivity that a patriarchy would miss that uh, inclusivity I includes, you know, the intent is not to exclude, but to say that, Hey, look, we're all in this together as it were, mm -hmm. you know, we're all humans and, and identity is a universal problem. Mm -hmm. And the more that we can all, have you know a universal solution Whew, that sounds kind of crazy sorry i didn't mean to put it quite like that but you know the more that we recognize that this is a universal problem the more equipped we will be for all of us to be empowered 100 percent, and 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 to be individuals you know i think that that's yeah. something we talked about as well as like these ideas of what is, you know, gender or what it belongs to a gender. Cause I think that's how we got into the idea of like, you know, what I then called like, you know, the body dysmorphia. And it's like, you know, I am a very hairy person. And for a long time, I felt so much shame around that. And actually after we had our conversation, I, um, you know, didn't shave my legs for like months. It was the holidays and I, and I kept it right. And whenever I went on a trip recently, like my friend was like, Danny, your legs look like a man. And I was like, you know, I wasn't, I didn't think about it because I, I was, I think actively keeping it to see how I would feel and how can yeah. I relate to my body differently. And in that time, this video popped up and it was so cool. It was a real forget what brand or it might've just been a content creator. And the message was, you are not hairy, like a man, you are hairy, like a human. And they showed all sorts of women, you know, women who may have like chest hair women who are showing like their peach fuzz yeah. and all these things. And I just, I even commented, I was like my inner child, feel so seen right now. And yeah. I just, to your point, I'm excited to get to a point where we stop saying like, you're like this, like a man or, or this, like a girl. It's like, you're just this, like a, a, an individual, like a human. And that is okay. Whatever that is. Yes. Oh my gosh. I had shivers there. No kidding. <laughs> we, we are who we are as, as humans. Oh gosh. That was beautiful. Um, Damn, I, we're out of time and I'm mad about it because I want to keep talking to you. Um, but we'll have, do, we'll have to do a round two. This is I know so much part fun. two, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Part two. Um, I will, I guess. Oh, I don't want to do it. I am going to say thank you to our listeners. Um, I am Amethyst Herrick. I've been talking with Danny Velasquez Mora. Um, we've been talking about gender and, and marketing and advertising on uh, Gender Identity Weekly. Um, Danny, thank you so much. I don't know how to express how much, you know, I feel for you, but I, this, this just raised the bar like in order of magnitude. So You're too <laughs> thank sweet. you thank so much you for having me. I mean, having this space has been so amazing and I'm excited for us to continue having conversations. And um, yeah, I, this is so important. Just content like this. So thank you. Thank you.
we, we will continue this. I was, I'm, I'm a little, sorry, I'm a little bit broken up. <laughs> I would love to continue this however we can. Thank you again.